the first time I really fell in love, I was really young. I was 17 and I lived overseas. I lived in Israel when I was a teenager and I fell in love with someone from South America, also a teenager. I, I wrote about him actually in, in the Four Noble Truths of Love because he taught me so much about love. I just fell madly in love with him. It, it was like waking up on a different orbit. <laughs> And we lived together, and it was a deep love. It was not like a teenager love. But I thought, well, is this it? Is this my life? Am I going to be with this person forever? I'm 17 years old. Am I going to live in this foreign country? Is this it? It could have been. But I was like, no, I have a lot more to live before something like this happens. Little did I know, it'll be like 30 more years. <laughs> But I have a lot more to live before something like this happens. I can't see it. So we would talk about breaking up and we would just hold each other and cry because it just didn't make sense to stay together or break up. Mm. So one night we would lie on our bed and cry. And one night he said to me, I think, I think you should go home, even to America. And I knew, I knew that that was heartbreaking for both of us. And I asked him what made him say that, and he said, because I love you more than I love us. And that was, oh my God, who wouldn't fall in love with someone that would say something like that, that would have that understanding he, as a 19-year-old or a 219-year-old, whatever it is, to look at you beyond who you are to me. That is so loving. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Susan, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Very, very glad to be here. Yeah. So, you know, it's very nice to have you back here. We had you uh, here, you know, as you just mentioned before you hit record, I think right on the eve of my last book launch where we did sort of a soulful exploration into inner wisdom. And when you told me about your new book, uh, The Four Noble Truths of Love, uh, I was immediately intrigued by it. There's this ongoing joke at Unmistakable Creative that usually the people I'm talking to are uh, people I'm talking to to solve some sort of problem in my life. And I remember somebody on Facebook once said, so who's this this week's relationship expert? Um, <laughs> but before we get into all of that, um, I want to ask you, uh, what social group were you a part of in high school? And oh. what impact did that end up having uh, on your life, your career, and this perspective that you have now? Oh my God, what a fantastic question. The social group I was a part of was the people who have no social group. I was the most shy loneriest person, I was completely confused by my, by my world and my life. And I didn't run with any particular people. I basically was in my room by myself trying to figure out what the hell was going on. So I, I'm sure I'm not alone in that. There was, you know, there, I, but I was in the group of people that had no group and fit in nowhere. Mm -hmm. is, is, that's possible, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I was, and I was a terrible student, uh, yeah. and uh, just a terrible student. I barely graduated high school and did not go to college. So the whole academic thing was not, the whole thing was a complete ball of confusion to me. Mm -hmm. What impact did that have on your perspective on relationships if you didn't fit in anywhere? And do you think that uh, because of that, you channeled all of that into kind of the work that you do today? Yes, I do. I think for, that because from a very early age, like the minute school started, I did not understand what was going on. I literally, I, I found out many, many years later that I have what you could call a learning disability, but it never, nobody ever picked up on that. So things literally didn't make sense to me. So I took the attitude from the very beginning that what makes sense to others does not make sense to me. I will have to figure out everything on my own. There are no other alternatives. What people are telling me 
is probably not going to be true for me. Let me just go my way. So it's sort of cultivated, whether through nature or nurture, and I'm sure it was both, just a very independent streak in terms of intellect and, and actions, too. I, I had this, what I call now a shadow mindset. I think everybody has a particular shadow mindset or a number of shadow mindsets, this thing that's left over, hung over from a previous time that you're semi-aware of, but usually not, but it colors everything you do and say and the way you look at things. And the shadow mindset for me, because of that, was I'm on my own. I got this. No one's going to help me. I'm alone. Let me get comfortable being alone. So that really had an impact on my view of relationships, of course. I, I was, I liked being in a relationship. I liked love. I liked sex. I liked connecting. But I could not really imagine committing to a long-term relationship. I wasn't like a Casanova or anything like that, but I couldn't imagine how it would work to be with one person for the rest of my life and how you could even promise that. Like, who in their right mind can promise that? And if you do promise it, what are you basing that promise on that is real? Mm. That was, those were my questions. Mm. Um, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned that, uh, you had a learning disability and yet you write books and you write beautiful books, like sentences that I envy in terms of how poetic they sound. Mm. Uh, so two things come from that. One is how did you, how did you, you know, sort of reconcile that and let go of that identity of a learning disability and still manage to do this? And two, I remember, um, in our last conversation, uh, we talked quite a bit about music and the mm -hmm. role that music played. And I'm wondering what impact music had on the way that you write. <laughs> Can I just say that you are so good at your job? <laughs> you ask the best questions. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, luckily, for whatever reason, I didn't fall for the notion that I was not smart. I just, I knew I was smart. I knew I, I didn't think I was a genius or anything, but the way I was treated was as someone uh, very unintelligent because, you know, that was, it was also a different time. Yeah. So, but I, I didn't believe that. I knew I, I knew that wasn't true. So I trusted my own mind. I trusted my point of view. And I, and I also felt like no one's looking at me. No one can hear me. No one can see me. I, I'm invisible. So I can do whatever I want. So I just pursued the intellectual interests that appealed to me. The primary one was reading. So I just it was one of those kids, maybe you were the same, that was just in love with words, in love with books, really wasn't in a place where people were telling me, how to think about books or how to read, you know, how to interpret what I read. So I interpreted it the way I wanted. And, you know, it, it might sound a little idyllic as I listen to myself. It was painful. It was very painful. I always loved to write and I always wanted to write and I always experimented with writing even when I was little. And so I just let it develop on its own, I guess you could say. And I, I think it was a benefit that I did not go to college because it would have, you know, it just as far as I can see, traditional education's primary job is to place constraints on your intellect and like blinders on a horse so that you just go in a particular direction. And it's painful to witness and it's painful to fail at doing that. Mm. And it's painful to succeed at doing that. So somehow, you know, whatever, I, I bypassed some some painful aspects of that. So when I learned I had a learning disability, by the way, I guess that's what you call it. I was relieved. And what happened was, uh, and I, I won't make this too long, but I was, about, this is about eight or nine years ago, I was, I took training to become a meditation instructor in my Buddhist lineage. That's something I, I really wanted to do. And I, there were 40 people in the program and one person failed. And that was me. I failed my meditation instructor training and I was devastated because Buddhist practice and study is, is my life, I would say. 
And I knew I could teach meditation. I knew I understood what was going on, but I could not answer the test questions. I could not, I, I just, I just didn't. So I failed. It was very miserable. And I drove away crying, like, what is wrong with me? I hadn't thought about learning in a traditional environment for many years because I, I never had to. But here I was again in this traditional environment and I had to and it didn't work. So I did some various kinds of testing and just learned that I guess the best way you could say it is when I hear something, I hear, I can't choose the meaning that the speaker intends. I, I could see many possible meanings, which is lovely on one hand, but it's also debilitating on another hand. You, not quite sure if you're connecting. But so it enabled me to let myself off the hook. It was very helpful. And in terms of music, yeah. You know, the one thing that comes to my mind to say is in Buddhist thought, there's a lot of emphasis on teachings, on what is they call emptiness, which is doesn't mean that all phenomena are dead. You know, all phenomena are null. Emptiness means empty of, of individual identity. Like you were not here, you could not be here without your parents, and they would not be here without their parents and the food they ate. And the, you didn't get here in a vacuum. And so, in that sense, you are empty of a separate identity, which is kind of a, a weird thing to think about. But music is the is the thing that makes me understand the Buddhist notion of emptiness more than anything else, because you can't touch it. You can't smell it. Of course, you can hear it, but you can change so many things about it. You can change the tempo. You can change the lyrics. You can change the instrumentation. You can change certain aspects of the chord progressions, I imagine, but you still recognize the song when you hear it, and the, the identity of the piece goes beyond its individual components. So that's, I guess, a long-winded way of saying one of the billions of zillions of things that I love about music. Um, and it remains really important to me. And in, in the acknowledgments for the Four Noble Truths of Love, I thank, I thank John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman, um, a singer who made a recording with John Coltrane, the only recording he ever made with a vocalist, a beautiful, legendary recording. Because that, that was my companion when I, as I was creating this work and I feel my heart connection to them is somehow connected to this work. Only probably I'm the only one who, who knows that or needs to know that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, do you remember what uh, those early expressions of writing were? Was it just writing in journals? Was it writing for, you know, uh, an audience? What, what were those early expressions? Yeah, I remember very clearly. I was interested, I loved science fiction, and like many, many, many kids in the 70s and 80s and up to this very moment, I loved A Wrinkle in Time. I loved that book. And that inspired me. And I guess I identified with the main character of Meg, who was just this outsider, nerdy person, um, but who felt that she had something to give, but needed very alternative circumstances to source that thing. Um, so I, I wrote, I wrote science fiction-y things with a character that was very much like Susan Piver <laughs> in the lead role. And, uh, I, I wrote story after story after story. And, but I also wrote, um, we had an assignment once in school, an excellent assignment to look at a picture, a photo, book of photographs and pick a photograph and then write a story about that photograph. Right, you know, not what does this photograph mean or what do you think these people are doing, but write something fictional based on this photograph. And that was a fantastic assignment. And after it was over, I just kept doing that with this book of photographs. And, and the other kind of writing I did that, did, I don't know what drew me to this, but now in my current life, I sort of see the thre the through line is I like, I would read the encyclopedia things in the encyclopedia and then try to summarize what I read in a short <laughs> in a shorter version I would write I'd write synopses or of things about Ecuador or you know nuclear fusion or whatever it was that I was reading about and I, f I found it very enjoyable to try to reorder information in a simplified way uh, not to simplify 
to simplify it, but to make it more direct, in my opinion, my personal opinion as a (laughs) nine-year-old. So, but now as a writer who works with Buddhist teachings in their application to ordinary life, I find that that was a skill that I still enjoy using. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What does your day-to-day writing uh, practice or creative practice look like today after having done so many books? It is very unsteady. It is, uh, I know, I know there are people are declaring the wars on art and insist on disciplined routines and I, I love them and I bless them and I envy them <laughs> and I am not one of them. <laughs> I, I get heartbroken about something and then I, I feel, oh God, unless I sit down and write about this, I'm just going to dissolve. I'm just going to be so sad, so upset, so angry, and I don't have any way of meeting my own heart. And so then something starts to arise. And then I, I would say as a writer, I'm kind of bingy. Instead of a little bit every day, I, I binge, you know, like a week, but that's all I do, or going away for a weekend or a month. And luckily I... I've been able to figure out ways to do that and only do that. And then nothing. Mm. I don't know. What's yours? I'm one of those people that you talked about. <laughs> oh, good for you. That's great. A I, thousand that, words every morning uh, as if my life depended on it. I bow to you. I but truly do. I, you know, it's funny because I've had this conversation with Adam Grant. I, I think for me, the reason I have to do that is it's the only way I can arrive at anything of high quality because if I didn't, uh, I'd never produce anything worth reading. Like I always say 90% of everything I write is just absolute garbage. Uh, right. But because I do it so much, that 10% is what enables me to write books and all the other things that I do. I think that is a brilliant strategy. I really, really do. And it's, it's the most forward strategy with the most forward motion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Um, let's shift gears a bit, but I want to actually open up this conversation of love by asking you two questions that I've only ever asked one other person. Uh, the first being, uh, tell me about the first time you got your heart broken. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> the, f- the first time there's so many first times, you know, in my young life, but the, the first time I got my heart broken, like all cattles, I was, I ended up writing a book about it, It, you know, like 10 years later, because I never forgot how painful it was. So I was in a relationship with a musician and we loved each other. We loved each other a lot. And we went through really, really difficult things together, like difficult, almost someone, one of us almost died. One of us got arrested for being a drug dealer. So it's a very bluesy story. I'm telling you. Um, But, and I loved him and I still love him. But I knew that it was not going to be, it would be hard to make a life together. And that was like a key sort of insight for me in my life as a person in relationships that just because you love someone doesn't mean that you can make a life together that you will both love. Somehow nobody points out that difference. Like you think, oh, we love each other. So naturally we should be able to make a life, but there's no connection. to It's something that's important to learn about. So I, I, we would break up a lot at my behest because I'm like, this, no, this is not, for a variety of reasons, this is not going to be a good relationship for us for the long term. Although there's so much love, so much love and so much, uh, I don't know what to call it even, just kindness, so much kindness. When we break up and get back together and break up and get back together, and then one time we broke up and he started going out with someone else. And my world cratered, even though I wanted to break up. It was I, something about that. I choose someone else it threw me into a hell room where I did stupid things and thought stupid things and was unable to draw breath. I would say for close to two years without feeling the power of this loss. 
I, I could not, I could not, to this day, I don't understand it. But that's, so that's basically the story. And, and the, I guess the addendum there is years went by, five years, seven years, where we didn't talk to each other. But then we started talking to each other again, and, and we became really good friends. In fact, I'm going to see him later today in a few hours. Hmm. And that's the only relationship I've ever had that ended where the friendship continued, like in this really honest way. So I'm grateful for that. We had a soul connection that's kind of cosmic. Hmm. It's funny because I read that book um, right after I had my first real heartbreak. Um, and I remember returning to it over and over and over every single day, looking through it for something that would make me feel better. How did you get yeah. over it? Yeah, you don't get over it. Do, do you? I mean, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about it. Uh, <clears throat> this was the first year in which I had finally stopped thinking about it after two or three years. I thought I was, you know, I was over it like it didn't hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. But it was still on my mind a lot. I would think about it every day. And I thought, you know, this happened a long time ago. I'm annoyed that I'm thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as weird as it might sound, I went and saw an energy healer a week later. Um, I stopped thinking about it. And I actually had to catch myself. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. I think, you know, one of the things that I tried to write in The Wisdom of a Broken Heart is that the heartbreak itself is not solid, meaning even though it feels completely overwhelming in the first months, years, however long it is for you, because everyone's time frame is different, it blots out the sun. It blots out everything, or so it seems. But if you start to pay attention, even if you're in the most acute of the acute phases of it, there are moments where it's not there. You know, like you just wake up in the morning and the moment before you think about it, remember it, it's not there. Or you watch something on television or listen to a piece of music and your mind and heart goes to what you see and hear and the heartbreak isn't there. It's, but then it immediately rushes back, of course. So there are gaps in the heartbreak. And over time, I feel like the gaps just get bigger. Mm. But the heartbreak doesn't disappear. But the only thing that really closes the chapter in my mind is to fall in love with someone else. Hmm. Even if it's a week later, that heartbreak disappears. Yeah. I remember how that. that works. I remember, I, I very distinctly remember that line saying that this other person will just disappear from your consciousness. <laughs> Poof. I never, I never forgot that. I remember that very distinctly. Oh, that's interesting. I'm oh, good. I'm glad. I yeah. Of all it, the lines in the book, that was the one. And all I could, I remember every time I read that is my only thought was when the hell is this going to happen? Yeah. And why hasn't it happened yesterday? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Understood. Um, so, uh, to follow up that with something a little lighter, tell me about the first time you fell in love. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Um, oh, it's so hard to think of the first time as if they're sequential because each time is different. I've been really lucky in my relationship life. I've had good relationships, like, you know, normal pains and breakups, but generally speaking with good people who cared about me and who wanted to be cared about and you know, good human beings. I guess the first time I really fell in love, I was really young. I was 17 and I lived overseas. I lived in Israel when I was a teenager 
And I fell in love with someone from South America, also a teenager. I, I wrote about him, actually, in, in The Four Noble Truths of Love because he taught me so much about love. I just fell madly in love with him. It, it was like waking up on a different orbit. <laughs> and we lived together. And it was a deep love. It was not like a teenager love. But I thought, well, is this it? Is this my life? Am I going to be with this person forever? I'm 17 years old. Am I going to live in this foreign country? Is this it? It could have been. But I was like, no, I have a lot more to live before something like this happens. Little did I know it will be like 30 more years. <laughs> but I have a lot more to live before something like this happens. I can't see it. So we would talk about breaking up and we would just hold each other and cry because it just didn't make sense to stay together or break up. Mm. So one night we would lie on our bed and cry. And one night he said to me, I think, I think you should go home into America. And I knew, I knew that that was sort of heartbreaking for both of us. And I asked him what made him say that. And he said, because I love you more than I love us. And that was, oh my God. Who wouldn't fall in love with someone that would say something like that, that would have that understanding as a 19-year-old or a 219-year-old, whatever it is, to look at you beyond who you are to me. That is so loving. So he was a really good person to fall in love with and a hard person to leave. And I thanked him in the acknowledgments of this book, even though I probably haven't spoken to him in over 20 years, because that helped me see what love was. Hmm. Well, uh, I think that really makes uh, a perfect segue to talking about um, what you call the Four Noble Truths of Love. But what I want to start by asking is, is what prompted you to write this book of all the books you could possibly write? Like, what inspired mm -hmm. this? Well, I'm married, and I've been married now for over 15 years and it's crazy <laughs> it's a crazy thing to do with another human being there are endless ups and downs and what really inspired me to write this was we were in a period of an endless down like we couldn't get along we just fought about everything it, it didn't make any sense there was nothing to fight about even like you know, what do you want to eat for dinner? We'd be like, whoa, we could, back, you know, just back each other into a corner with some reason why that question was horrible or stupid or inappropriate or just crazy, crazy stuff. And it just went on and on for months. We just were so disconnected. Everything one said upset the other, even to the most minuscule things. And so I thought, I guess this is over. Is this over? I And I was crying one day, and I, I thought to myself, I don't even know where to begin fixing this, because we've tried everything, talking, not talking, going to the therapist, having sex all the time, having sex none of the time, ignoring each other, be fr you know, being friendly to it. We tried everything, and I thought, I have no idea where to begin fixing this. And a voice in my head said, begin at the beginning. At the beginning are four noble truths. And I've been a Buddhist just a little bit longer than I've been a wife, so I've been a practitioner for a fairly long time. And so that meant something to me. The four noble truths are the core teachings of the entire Buddha Dharma. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't understand, though. Begin at the beginning. At the beginning are four noble truths. Life is suffering. The cause of suffering is grasping. There's a way to stop suffering. And there's an eightfold path. Ha, okay. What does that have to do with my relationship? It didn't sound like it had anything to do with my relationship except the suffering part. So I just sat down and thought about it. Well, what would these Four Noble Truths be if they were applied to my relationship? Not all relationships, because just me. What, what, how can I get this? How can this be helpful? Because I need help. And the Four Noble Truths very easily and, you know, gracefully, I would say, just reconfigured themselves on a piece of paper that I happened to be writing on as the Four Noble Truths of Love. It seemed very clear. 
And so I didn't, that was probably five years ago. I, I didn't write about it necessarily. I started teaching it. Um, and then eventually I, I thought, well, I, I, I would like to write about this because what is more important? What is more important than the, the, being able to love each other, not just talking about romantic relationships, but to know how to work with the connect, connections and disconnections that occur even in the most distant friendship, mm. let alone the most intimate, passionate, romantic relationship. Yeah. We don't know how to do that. So how, how, how do you do that? Buddhism actually has a lot to say on how to do that. So I, I thought it would be really useful. Well, let's get into each of the four truths. Um, you know, as I told you before, we uh, you know, I, we hit record. I was Instagramming stuff from your book as well as filling my Evernote. But you know, the first one that you bring up is this notion that relationships are, are uncomfortable. And you say the truth is relationships never stabilize. When you solve one problem, another arises. There's actually no way to get comfortable. They're constantly in flux because relationships are alive. And yet there's, I think, this reptilian part of us almost that craves comfort and security. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, why is that? Why do we think that things are going to stabilize? Why are we always thinking, okay, if this stabilizes, things will get better? Right. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think there's so many ways to answer that question. And part of it is just human nature. You know, we dating back to the amygdala years or whatever, when you're like, I just need to find someone to help me not get eaten by bears or something. And there's a part of us that just wants to lock that down. And okay, cool. That's cool. And then, but I think the other piece of it is for whatever reason, our culture has decided to hide the truth from us and instead to present this idea that falling in love leads to an everlasting state of love and falling in love is everything it's amazing i don't it's it's so real it's so powerful it's so transcendent it transports you to another realm absolutely i, I don't it's so powerful and real but it you can't have to come back to this realm at some point and but there, there's just very little to educate us on what how you do that and why you would do that and what you do when you come back here. So, you know, when most of us say we're looking for love, this is I, my discovery from writing about heartbreak and now love, we don't necessarily mean that exclusively. What we mean is we're looking for safety or we're looking for someone to love us and then we will love them back. So we want not really looking for a relationship. We're looking for a cocoon with someone hot <laughs> and funny and nice and, you know, whatever else you might like in another, in another person. Mm. And there is no cocoon. There's this idea that all the problems that I face, my insecurities, my worries, my, you know, from the most basic, how am I going to eat and where does money, how am I going to get money to the more, you know, metaphysical, what is the meaning of my life and who am I? I think, well, I'm going to answer all those questions if I can find the right relationship. And then I will stop suffering. So the first noble truth in Buddhism is life suffering. It doesn't mean life sucks, by the way. It just means everything changes. That's the primal truth. That's the essence of our existence is everything changes. And that's painful. But when it, we think, well, I'm going to stop that cycle of change and I'm going to establish myself somewhere solid and permanent through this other person, through this relationship. And that's a very unkind thing to do to yourself and, and another person. Make them a device in your search for comfort. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> there's a, another uh, sentence that I ended up uh, underlining from this particular truth. Uh, and you said, you know, when it comes to love, this unkindness to self begins to mix in with our relationship. Uh, that struck me in particular because uh, I did, you know, some work with a, a dating coach who has also been a guest here on Unmistakable Creative. And one of the things he said to me that I, I really kind of saved me, he said, so often when somebody else doesn't want us, he said, it's largely uh, not an, uh, like not accepting ourselves that causes us so much pain. Hmm. Not accepting ourselves that causes so much pain. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I can see that. I think what I meant by unkindness to self mixes with your relationship is that the closer you get to someone, the less you are able you are to see them. And at some point in a long-term relationship, I don't necessarily mean you're dating someone or falling in love with someone, but you're in a, in a, a relationship with someone and you're both in it and it's been a year or 10 years or 100 years or whatever it is, you start to find that person very irritating. <laughs> 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 it's quite disheartening. Yeah. But you like weird things tick you off and weird moments suddenly you feel very lonely and or they do something that you thought was adorable for a long time, and then you're you're like, ew, I don't like that, and I don't know what it is that. But this, if you notice, and I, when I was a kid, I noticed this. With my parents' friends, nobody seemed to like each other. And I, I thought, how does that happen? Hmm. That there's this this uh, edginess and a snappishness in often in long term relationships between perfectly nice people. So one way. I realized that that could be explained in addition to just normal human emotional puniness that we all have is we all have a tremendous harshness. I, I say all, even though there may be some exceptions, like maybe the Dalai Lama or something, but the most of people I know, including myself have this very, very harsh voice inside that is whipping them very hard and, condemning and critiquing and criticizing and the minute you get think oh I, if only I could do this everything would be good and the minute you get close to this the bar is raised and there, there's just this harshness to self that is unremitting in, in our world and the closer you get to someone else the less able you are to differentiate between yourself and them I, I, I think on an energetic level and even on a physical level, sometimes when you sleep next to someone night after night after night, you feel like, oh, there's this one body here or, you know, this is so familiar to me. It almost feels like me to me. And so then you start treating that other person like you treat me, which is unkind. So harshness to self, unkindness to self blends with your... The, if you speak to yourself with that unkindness, it bleeds into the way you speak to someone else. And the primary reason may not, maybe because they're irritating, but it's more likely that it's because you can't tell who's who and you're speaking to them as you would yourself. So there's some deep inner work, I think. Not to solve that, because to solve that is asking too much. Because then we start to get very hard on ourselves for not being able to not be hard on ourselves. And we just apply the same, you know, strategy. Like, okay, I'm going to really not be hard on myself. I'm going to give up until I stop. And if I screw up, I'm just going to get back up and try again. And if I fail, I'm a loser. And, well, that's not going to work. You cannot create peace through aggression. But if you start to notice it, you start to notice the inner voice that's great. That's all you have to do. Just notice it and roll with it and feel it and learn to discriminate between what you're thinking about yourself and life and the world and who this other person is. Like discern. Discernment, discernment, discernment. That's loving. That's a loving thing to do. It's unloving, I think, to say, you have to help me fix my psychological problems or even I'm going to, I have to fix my psychological problems. Otherwise, I'm not fit for love. I call bullshit on that. It's, it's more spacious and flexible and big than that. You can be with all of your craziness and all of your wounds and all of your unhealed everythings. You can bring them. You, you should bring them. They can be included. You don't have to solve them. But you, all you have to do is be aware of them. And then you have lots and lots of options. But without the awareness, that's why I think meditation, as a meditation teacher, is, is so crucial. Without the awareness, you're, you, have no, you have no choices. You're just led around. Yeah. Wow. Um, 
So let's look at the second truth. You said that thinking that relationships are supposed to be comfortable is what makes them uncomfortable. And this section, this line in particular was what really struck me. You said, if you're hoping for a relationship that will drop into your lap from heaven, put an end to all your self-doubt and snuggle you, you may be running on the fumes of romantic materialism rather than the desire for true love, which is discovered on the spot rather than in advance. Um, <clears throat> Where does that whole idea of romantic materialism come from, and, and you know what role does um, popular culture and, and what we see on TV and, and in the media play in all of that? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for asking me that. Uh, part because it gives me a chance to attribute the source of that thought to the great Tibetan meditation master Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who defined something called the Three Lords of Materialism. And he came to the West in this, this late 60s, Europe, and this early 70s to the United States, and, and found a lot of hippies who were spiritual seekers, or so they thought. But what he saw were people who were being materialistic in their spiritual search. And he defined the three lords of materialism, the lord of form, which all the lords are saying, if you do this, you can stop suffering. The Lord of Form says, get a nice house, get a bunch of money, get this degree, get out of your neighborhood, get whatever it is in the uh, physical world, and you will be safe. Yeah, okay. Well, it's better to have some money versus no money. It's better to have a place to live than no place to live. But and I, if you want a lot of money and a gray in the palace, good, get it. That's great. However, it will not stop you from suffering because you're human. So, okay, great. The second Lord is the Lord of speech, which speech is just defined as not just the way you talk, but of systems of thought that might save you. If you can get the right philosophy, the right psychology, the right, if you can analyze things accurately, if you can explain them well, the Lord of speech says you will then be exempt from suffering. And the third Lord is the Lord of mind which says if you can have the right spiritual practice, if you can be really, really good at meditating, you will have a higher status among your fellow humans and be all Zen, quote unquote, or, or he didn't, Trugim Trugba didn't say that, obviously, but you will be exempt from suffering because you'll be in some permanent blissed out state. Ixne, 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 of the materialism. So all the three lords are saying, do these three things, and they're very insidious, and we all have, you know, are in uh, service to these lords. But romantic materialism along these lines I made up is uh, thinking if I can find the right relationship, all my problems will be solved, my suffering will go away, I'll be, I'll be safe, as we were sort of talking about earlier. So, you know, it's, it's. Uh, yeah, if you're looking for something perfect and something that will snuggle you, those are great things to have a beautiful relationship and be held with great tenderness. Those, those are really beautiful things worth longing for. But if you think, well, then I will be exempt from the sorrow of loss or the pain of change or the, you know, grief of aging, then that won't happen. Hmm. I'm sorry. No, not at all. <laughs> um, you know, the other piece of this is, uh, you know, third noble truth, which was this notion of meeting discomfort together being love. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, it's really, um, a great partner, I would say is not someone who will cop to, their actions, although that's a great thing. It's not someone who will constantly work to make you happier, even. It's not someone who will constantly work to make you more comfortable. It's not someone who will sit and talk with you about your problems endlessly, which is great. All those things are great. I'm in no way um, dissing those things, but rather than someone who will look at you or themselves as the source of the problem and then try to fix it, a great partner is one who will t actually turn away from you to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. This is the mental image I have and look at the problem together. Like this is something that has entered our ecosystem. 
You may think it's my fault. I may think it's your fault. Let's let that go for a minute and look at this weather front that has just blown through. What is it? Let's, feel, let's, let's experience it together. Let's feel it together. You know, now we really love each other. That's great. Well, now we just could care less about each other. That's not great, but that's what's happening. Could be interesting, but let's just look at it. Hmm. Or now I love you, but you don't really care about me. And now it's the opposite. Or It's like you're on this ride. Because it is a ride in the sense that it's ever changing and moving. And can you be on the ride with that person through all the phases, excluding addiction, abuse, whether it's mental, physical, sexual, obviously that's not to be ridden. That is, that's a different category, but the other kinds of, you know, what I would call ordinary discomforts, which can range from anything like you're always late to you think you're going to have gender reassignment surgery. And you forgot to tell me that, you know, these, that those are very uncomfortable things. So, but they're not addiction or abuse or anything like that. So those things are not to be included in my opinion, but can you be on this ride together? I remember when, when, when my husband and I got married, uh, we had a we had kind of a big wedding. It was nothing like what we intended, but it ended up being really fun. And the advice, someone gave me this advice who had just gotten married themselves. And she said, the best advice I can give you for your wedding is stay together. Like, like it's tempting. You get pulled away by your family. He'll get pulled away by his family or you have different friends and you'll, but go stay connected to each other so that when you, at the end of the day, you will both have been at the same wedding. <laughs> and that was really, really good advice. I should call her and thank her for that actually, because that's a really good just analogy or metaphor. I'm not sure which one it is for the whole friggin' thing. Do it together. Wow. Um, so this fourth noble truth, uh, you say that there is a path to liberation from suffering and this, you know, line in particular really stood out to me. The truth is that relationships seem to be beyond our capacity to grasp. They arise, abide and dissolve under mysterious circumstances. We have no idea why we fall in love with this person or that one. We don't know why love just disappears and then reappears. Chemistry is inexplicable. I have no idea what causes the blissful connections and devastating raptures that happen in my own marriage over and over. And I guess a couple of questions come from that. One is, um, why is it that we're so hell bent on trying to control these things, even because though they're clearly out of our control? Because there's nothing more frightening than love. There's nothing more vulnerable. It is the most vulnerable state. You have given your heart to someone. They see you. You see them. You are, I don't know how many layers of clothing you put on, you're always naked. And it's extremely vulnerable. So you want to lock this thing down and make it safe. And, of course, there's no way to do that. I mean, you can make it safe, but then it's not love. It's something else. Yeah. I don't know what it's called. But, it. yeah, so, of course, you know, when we're in a very vulnerable situation where we can be devastated, we've both had our heart broken, you and I. We know the truth of how painful it can be. Yeah. And you would go a long way to avoid having that happen again, understandably, but you cannot make it not happen again. So we think, well, I'll, you could at least, you know, increase, decrease the odds that it will happen by just being smarter about this and that and so forth. But yeah, so, you know, it's, it's dangerous to love. And so we want to make it safer in some ways and some good, but you can't really make it completely safe. I don't think. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, <clears throat> I want to come full circle, uh, and come back to something that you said at the very beginning of our conversation about education. And given that uh, this subject in particular has been very interesting to me, uh, as I'm thinking about the next book, um, what do you think we should have learned at school, but never did? Oh my goodness. I think we should have learned how to think for ourselves. I, I think, I mean, that may sound trite, but we should learn how to know our own minds, not what someone else is trying to put in them. That is the source of wisdom. Is your mind is the source of wisdom, not anything in a book. So 
books are great. I write them. I read them. I love them. But without knowing your own mind, your own wisdom, you spend a lot of time, years, decades, your lifetimes being confused about who you are. So you should learn how to identify yourself in the great stream of humanity. Incredible. Wow. Um, this has been really, really beautiful, uh, as, I, as I expected it would be, having read the book. Um, so I have one last question for you, which I know I've asked you before, and I'm curious how the answer will have changed uh, three years later. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Oh. You know what? I think I, now that you asked me, I think I remember what I said, and I think it hasn't changed. Genuine, genuineness. So you can authenticity. You can feel when you're with someone who is unafraid of themselves and has shown up with all of their brilliance and confusion and flaws and beauty, and is just sitting right in front of you, fully genuine. That is unmistakable. Hmm. Amazing. Um, where can people find out more about you, your work, uh, and the book? Uh, you can go to my website, susanpiver.com. Piver is P-I-V-E-R. And this one is, I'm self-publishing. It's, it's, it's an ex interesting experiment. So susanpiver.com is the best place to get the book. It may be the only place to get the book, yeah. but it's a good place to start in any case. Awesome. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and uh, sharing your story and your insights with our listeners. This has been really beautiful. I have loved talking with you. It is such a delight. It, I really mean it. it. Thank you. Thank you. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.